All right, guys, so today is going to be fun. We're going to check out a bunch of myths. 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 That's hard to say. We're going to check out a bunch of myths related to saxophone reeds. So tomorrow I'm going back out for another leg of touring with Chris Bodie, and I've got to get some reeds ready. And we thought it might be a fun opportunity to try a bunch of different myths that we've heard over the years that people do with their saxophone reeds to hopefully maybe see if we can make them play better. So will we be busting a bunch of myths, upholding a bunch of myths, or a mixture of both? Let's find out. And it's worth noting just really quick that we are using Nexus saxophone reeds today. If you don't already know what Nexus saxophones is, it is a product line created by myself and Jack Tyler of the Boston Sax Shop. We've already created saxophones, mouthpieces, a ligature, and these reeds that you're about to see and hear. This video is of course not a review of any of those products. I won't be reviewing any of those products. I might tell you about some of those products sometimes, but obviously I am biased, so I'm not going to review them. However, if you feel like checking out the reviews at nexussaxophones.com, it's been really nice to see a lot of great customer feedback. You can check out the background of why we created all of the Nexus products, in particular with the reeds, kind of a cool backstory. We've modeled them off of reeds that we found from the 70s and 80s with the goal of just creating a really powerful, balanced, warm sounding reed. And so for many of these myths, we're gonna consult with our in-house reed expert, that is of course, Jack. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell button so you get notifications when we release something new. We've got a bunch of really fun stuff coming at you in these coming months. So let's see what Jack has to say about myth number one, which is going to be soaking reeds in vodka as opposed to in your own mouth or with just water. Vodka, is there any merit to this? Does it help with anything? Soaking reeds in vodka. Mm. I think the theory behind it is that mm. the alcohol content will kill bacteria. Right. But obviously, you know, unless you're drinking like a hundred proof, like rot gut vodka, I don't think it will actually do that. Like you might as right. well use Listerine, you know, but that's right. the theory behind it. Right. So, is it safe to use Listerine and, and then, you know, you know, uh, yeah, so the, play your, your after your that? Will turn, your reads will turn green. <laughs> so maybe not a good idea. <laughs> they will taste like mint, which, you know, could be a positive, but that right. will kill bacteria. Right. Um, if that's something you're, you know, worried about. However, you are, after all, playing saxophone, which is mm. just a bacteria nightmare. So it yeah. seems like there's bigger things to be concerned about. <laughs> right, totally. All right, so this isn't a perfect experiment as far as scientific testing goes, but what we're going to try to do here is we're going to soak the reed in water first and then play it, see how it sounds, and then soak the reed in vodka for a while and play it after and see if it sounds any better after that. Pour in some water. This is uh, not very cleanly. I'm gonna have to definitely clean this up after. <laughs> We're gonna use a two and a half Nexus reed. I always use two and a halfs or threes. I just sort of go back and forth depending on my mood or whatever. I don't know, I like them both. All right, so we'll let this soak for just a couple minutes in water and then I'll play it, we'll see how it sounds. And then we'll do a couple minutes in vodka and see if it's any better. So as Jack said earlier, part of this myth is about whether it sterilizes the reed. And as he mentioned, as a reed expert, perhaps he debunked that. But I have also heard some people say that it makes the reed play better. So. We're gonna try it out and see what happens. All right, guys, so we've been soaking this reed for a couple minutes, so let's go ahead and slap this one on, and uh, we'll see what it sounds like just soaking it in water. All right, so I'll try to play kind of the same thing just for sake of comparison, and now we'll go ahead and pour some vodka, and we'll soak the reed in vodka for a couple minutes. All right, it's been a couple minutes. Let's take this out of the vodka and uh, see if it plays any better. Well, certainly tastes different. <laughs> Well, if it plays any differently, it's certainly extremely subtle. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, in my opinion, this myth is busted. All right, so now let's myth bust the next myth, which is going to be, does it help to push 
on the top of the reed and push the top of the reed into the mouthpiece. All right, so for this myth, we're gonna go ahead and use a strength three reed. And we're gonna talk about two things. One is going to be the location of the reed on the mouthpiece. So the location of the reed on the mouthpiece actually does make a, a big difference, right? Like yeah. how far down it is from the tip and stuff like that, that, that makes a big difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Right. So the general rule of thumb is that if you put the reed over the tip, so it's mm -hmm. hanging you know, off the end of the mouthpiece, that's going to increase resistance mm -hmm. because in some ways it's going to make it much more difficult for the reed to seal. The ideal right. position is to put the reed so that when you press it down with your thumb, which will simulate where the reed is actually going to seal, to be right below the actual tip of the tip rail so that you're ensuring that it's creating a full seal along the rails and the tip itself. Right. But if you're in a bind and your reed is too hard, you can back it down a little bit mm. below the tip rail and that will typically make it a little bit softer. This is not so much of a myth. This is something that, as Jack was saying, is definitely proven and so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how much of a difference that makes. So first off, let's soak this reed for a couple minutes in water, and then I'll play it and show you how the location of the reed on the mouthpiece does in fact make a pretty big difference. All right, so let's give this one a try. So what we're gonna see here is if we put the reed too high, so when you press down on the reed, it's above the mouthpiece, it's going to be pretty difficult to play. It'll sound kind of like this. Compared to if you slide down the reed, so you just have a little bit of space above the reed, where you can see the mouthpiece, it's gonna be a lot easier to play. Okay, again, so that is a more of a tip, really, and something that we've known is a very successful trick for making sure that your reed plays well. But now let's check out a myth. So to be totally open here, this is something that I do. So I'm gonna tell you that I actually dig this and I'll show you guys and you can decide for yourselves whether you think that it could be helpful. So this is something that I heard from various sax players when I was a kid and I like to do it. What we're gonna do is we're actually going to push down on the reed just a little bit. It's kind of a way of loosening up the tension a little bit just to make it a little bit easier to play. So right out of the box, it's gonna feel like it's more broken in. So one more time, I'll just play this read as is so you can hear it now. And now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna push down on the read just a little bit. If you do it too much, it's gonna get really stuffy in the upper register. But if you just give it a little pleasant push, it's gonna loosen things up. Now, whether that sounds better is subjective, but you will find that the feeling of it is just gonna become a little bit easier to play. So again, it's subtle and everything that we're gonna be working with here is going to be subtle, but try it yourself so you can get a sense of how it feels as the feeling might even be more significant than the sound difference. So again, I'm biased here, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that this myth is plausible. All right, so now we're gonna test the next myth, which is going to be that you should never let your reeds warp. Okay, so how about when a reed warps? Bad thing? Any, any positives to it? Um, yeah, always, always a bad thing. And mm -hmm. also there's really two different types of reed warpage, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, the first is the most obvious one, which is when the tip starts to look like a Ruffles potato chip. Mm -hmm. And why that's bad, is the tip of the reed is the thinnest part of the reed, which means, mm. I mean, that's why your reed dies, because mm. the tip of the reed ends up breaking down the mm. fastest. Mm -hmm. So every time it goes through that level, flat surface to becoming, you know, rippled, you're just destroying the structural integrity of the reed much quicker. So mm -hmm. if you can avoid the reed getting that way, which means, number one, storing it on a flat surface, mm. number two, maintaining some level of humidity control, mm. your reeds are inherently going to last longer. Mm. The other way that a reed warps, which people don't mm. talk about quite as much, is on basically the table of the mm. reed. The thickest part of the reed tends to swell up in the middle. So if you flip your reed over the back, it's like right above where the logo or whatever brand reed you play, which should be a Nexus reed. Mm. Um, and when that swells, it's not going to seal on your mouthpiece as well. It's going to push off from the table and you're going to have to 
crank your ligature in order to make it, uh, you know, play correctly. Mm-hmm. So if like the second day you take your reeds out and they're playing really stuffy and the tip looks flat, there's a good chance that the, the table of the reed needs to be leveled off in order for it to seal again. Okay. All right, so next we're gonna test this warped reed myth. And as you heard, Jack said that it does really truly affect the reed to get warped like this. But I will tell you in my humble opinion that I've had many reeds just sitting out for weeks, like this one, where after I end up soaking it for a while so it straightens back out, it ends up actually playing better for me in a way. So let's find out if that actually ends up working with this reed. Again, this stuff is all subjective, so ultimately, you'll maybe want to try it yourself and see what happens. All right, so this reed is going to need several minutes at least to soak in order to straighten back out. All right, so this reed's been soaking for a little while now, probably about five to 10 minutes. And uh, it's not perfect. Um, you know, but it's it's pretty straight at this point. Um, and, you know, I find usually with after playing it for a few minutes, it's, it's going to start to straighten out as you play it. So let's see what this one sounds like. Let's see if it's total trash or if it feels good at all. Okay, so that wasn't like the best read that I've ever played, but it actually felt pretty good. So considering that this is a read that I just, you know, put away out to the side weeks ago and didn't plan on playing because I didn't think that it was the best read ever and I didn't think that I would play it on a gig. And now it's actually at a point where, honestly, I feel like it's pretty decent and I would consider playing it on a gig. I think that this myth might actually be busted. All right, so now let's test the next myth, which is going to be rubbing a reed with paper right out of the box to make it last longer. Now, this myth, to ultimately test it, we would need to do it over time. But we are going to test one thing about this myth, which is, will it change the sound immediately to rub it with the paper? Then we have our expert, Jack, who will speak to his experience in terms of longevity with this myth. Yeah, so you've heard of some people increasing the life of the reed by rubbing it with paper? Yes, I have. I, I had a teacher that uh, did this where basically you get a new reed and you take computer paper and like rub the vamp. And okay. the theory is that it will seal basically the pores of the reed because mm. a reed, when it comes fresh out of the box, will be porous. Mm and basically stabilize the reed a lot quicker. Okay. I did find that I didn't like how the reeds played afterwards for me, but mm. it did actually increase the life of the reed doing that right out of the box. But okay. it's, you know, it's something everybody should just try and see if they like. All right, so again, we're not gonna be able to test the longevity of this reed today, but we will be able to address whether rubbing this paper on the vamp of the reed, as Jack said, we'll be able to test whether it changes the sound of this read. So first, we're gonna go back to that first read that we started with. This one was fresh out of the box. We're gonna play it for a second. This one has been soaked in water and vodka. Now I'm just gonna put it back into my mouth for a quick second. We're gonna slap it on. We're gonna see what it sounds like as a reminder. Then we're gonna rub this paper on the vamp and we're gonna see if that changes the sound. Now Jack says in his experience, it does actually help with longevity. But if I'm getting this right, he wasn't crazy about how it changed the sound immediately after you do it. So let's find out if it affects this read here. All right, so now let's try this. I've actually never done this before. First time for me, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do what Jack said. Gonna rub computer paper on the vamp of the read and we'll see if it changes the sound. All right, so I'm not even sure if I did that right, but it did definitely change the sound a little bit. It was very, very subtle. I'm not sure if I liked it better or worse, but one thing is for sure, it did have a slight effect on the sound, and we had Jack, a read expert, mentioning that he has experimented with this and it has affected the longevity for the better. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and call this myth plausible.
So old, old school dudes used to put the tip of the reed over a quarter and burn it off with a lighter to make it stronger, right? That was a thing? Yes. Um, I remember like multiple times I've mm. gotten old saxophones in the shop and in the case will be like a little Zippo lighter and a quarter. And I finally asked somebody what that was for and that's what they said. And so it's mm. basically another variation on the reed clipper. Uh, it just looks way cooler when you're burning a reed on stage. <laughs> right, right. Crazy. <laughs> Although not effective, not very effective. <laughs> For sure. And then, so with clipping a reed, I, I don't even have a reed clip. I've only tried it a few times. And to yeah. me, it, did, it, it, like, it didn't help anything. What's, what's your theory on that? Yeah, yeah. So, right, the idea behind clipping a reed is that it will increase the strength. Mm -hmm. But the thing that people don't talk about is that when you clip the so reed strength is determined by the flexibility of the tip of the reed, right? Most mm -hmm. people might not be aware the saxophone reeds are all cut identically the same, mm -hmm. and then they're tested for the flexibility of the tip to determine their strength. It's not like they're actually, like a number four reed is not thicker at the tip than a number two reed. It's the yeah. exact same cut, it just has to do with the uh, flexibility. Mm -hmm. So when you clip a reed, you're going to completely change the geometry of the cut and you are actually making the tip of the reed thicker which will add resistance but it's going to completely change like it's not going to play with the same tonal characteristics of that reed up a half strength you right know? okay okay so now we're going to do the old school trick for you know essentially um clipping the top of a reed but in a way where you're not using a reed clipper tool and we you know sort of heard about the fact that you know maybe reed clipping doesn't actually have that much value but either way we're gonna try to do it this old school way and see what it ends up doing okay so this is something i've never done before i have no idea if i'm doing it right but i'm gonna go ahead and just try to burn the tip with a quarter i don't know how this makes any sense All right, so what this has sort of done is just burn the top of the reed, and um, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what it plays like. So again, this is the reed that I just played, the reed that was previously warped, and uh, we'll see what this does. <laughs> All right, so I have to say that I think this did effectively work for feeling the same as how a clipped reed feels. However, I have to say, I don't really like how it feels to clip a reed. I think it makes the reed feel like it has less core and muscle and it just kind of gets a little thin. And it sounds like our reed expert Jack did feel that same way. With all that being said though, it did effectively work as a way to clip a reed. So I guess we'll say this myth is Awesome. All right, now this next one actually comes from a myth that Jack is about to tell you about. This is something that Joe Henderson would do with his reeds. So you also told me that there was a, a, a thing that Joe Henderson used to do. Do you heard from Bill Pierce? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard the story from Bill and a couple other people that I would consider first-hand accounts, mm -hmm. but you know, Joe played a very small mouthpiece mm -hmm. and right. in terms of the tip opening, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, multiple people have told me that before the set, in order to make the mouthpiece feel like it was a bigger tip opening, mm -hmm. he, would, he would put the ligature on and the reed on mm -hmm. and use his mouthpiece cap and put it in between the reed and the mouthpiece and then bend the reed outward, basically opening up the mouthpiece, but from the reed side, which wow. is insane. But he's Joe Anderson, and it clearly works. <laughs> it worked for him, <laughs> right. <laughs> Crazy, nuts. All right, so for this next myth, as you heard, what we're going to be testing is this idea of essentially moving the reed manually away from the mouthpiece to actually make your tip opening wider. Now, as you heard, what Joe Henderson would do is he would take his mouthpiece cap and use that to move the reed away from the mouthpiece. So what we'll do first is we're gonna try this new reed. We're gonna see how it sounds before we do this experiment. <laughs> Now, I'm 
probably not going to remember what I just played, but what we're going to try to do now is we're going to take a knife. And so by using a knife instead of a mouthpiece cap, hopefully we're going to be able to perfectly and evenly pull this reed away from the tip. And so I'm just kind of pulling it back here and I'll be fairly aggressive with it, I guess, just to see if we can really create the effect of widening the tip opening. Yeah, looks a little wider, so we'll see what happens. Okay, well, I mean, <laughs> that was surprising to me, but I actually have to say, I do think that actually felt similar to playing a slightly wider tip opening. Can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that this myth is plausible. Now this last myth is a legend that has existed for a very long time in the saxophone community. I have never tried this myself, but legend has it that if you slam the reed on a table, it will play better than it's ever played. All right, so the final test of the day. This is one that I've been curious to try for a long time. Does smashing the reed on a table help it play better? The moment of truth. Nice.